Welcome to our talk today. Um, our talk is Federated GraphQL to Solve Service Sprawl at Major League Baseball. Um, today, we're going to go over um, some high level, some in depth on the last kind of eight months to 12 months of us uh, implementing a federated GraphQL architecture um, within the web platform team at Major League Baseball. So just to kick us off, talk about who we are, what is web platform. Uh, my name is Matt Oliver. I'm the senior, senior engineering uh, manager on the web platform team. And I'm Alessia Medvedeva. I'm a software engineer in the same team. Um, so when we're talking about web platform, what is that? Um, our team handles all the base architecture, infrastructure, and DevOps um, for MLB's web footprint. Um, so MLB.com, MIL.com, um, USA Baseball, Playball. There's a ton of different kind of uh, touch points um, within all these different clients that we have in order to serve baseball experiences to um, our fans. And we support multiple front end teams, which is, makes up around 30 plus developers. I mean, really what we're tasked to do on top of kind of uh, supporting all the stuff above is be more forward thinking within the organization in terms of new web frameworks, new web architecture paradigms, um, you know, kind of leading that um, within uh, our organization. Um, so our, our biggest responsibilities include the server side rendering architecture, which we are moving from an old handlebars architecture to React and Next, and, so, and supporting services that power uh, more niche front end stuff like personalization, which is a, a big kind of cornerstone of our GraphQL architecture. Um, this is very challenging because to render a the, the MLB.com that you see when you go to MLB.com takes many, many, many services. Um, and historically, there's just been a lot of um, logistics around how that data is pulled and how we eventually render our page because of all the data that's involved. And so just kind of kicking off the problem here, we have different clients. And to the right, you can see we have web, um, iOS, and Android on top of a bunch of other things like our connected devices that need data from many teams within MLB that are maintained by different teams, right? Different people. And so coordinating all that has been a challenge. So going into the specifics, um, one of the reasons we started looking into GraphQL is because we have low visibility into who is making calls on our platform. Um, we have a lot of, like I said, we have a lot of clients and um, that are managed by different teams. And sometimes, uh, you know, we have services from within our organization or external um, uh, uh, clients that are pulling data from us. And it's, and it's hard to really know who is pulling data from our platform, which makes making model changes and, and potentially breaking changes really hard because it's hard to notify those clients or it's really just hard to logistically coordinate all that stuff that's going on. Um, there's a lot of evidence of redundant calls within our architecture. So, um, you know, services calling services and duplicating those calls. And there's just a lot of waste um, in terms of, you know, how all these services are communicating. Unfortunately, we're prone to DDoSing ourselves because of that. You know, there's an errant kind of code push that goes out. We end up hosing, whether it's our CMS or some other, our backend service. And it's really these self-inflicted wounds that are, you know, making us reevaluate, kind of making this architecture a little bit more sane. We've been burned by third-party integrations. And so a big thing is to be able to isolate our, our back house services or isolate our clients from our back of house services. So if we need to swap things out, um, whether it's you know a, a logistical one or an economic one, uh, we could easily do that without affecting our clients. Um, and a lot of our services have different caching structures. These most of our teams manage their own caches, um, and you know it, it becomes hard to figure out you know what's getting cached where for how long. And so you know trying to centralize everything to make things a little bit more like I said, sane and easy to reason about. Um, also handling upstream failures. Um, again, each team throws different errors or handles errors differently and reacting to those errors, you know, it is an issue. So again, trying to centralize things in order to, you know, have a cohesive strategy around a lot of these things. So the most common request response pattern today is your typical RESTful service where the clients are doing the fetching of data and stitching things together. In this diagram, we have our diverse set of clients all making calls individually to one or more of our services. If we are lucky, we have a CDN and a cache of some kind fronting our services to give us some stability and a breathing room. The burden of the clients is that they're responsible for knowing where and how to stitch together desperate service responses in order to successfully render their content. 
So what what's wrong with this picture? We have some of the big issues surrounding the architecture. Other clients uh, can be very chatty. They are sometimes making multiple calls to services in in or all or nothing fashion. <laughs> this ends up tying our front end implementation to the back end data model, which in turn requires multiple code changes when the models inevitably change. We also have issues around backend service exposure, allowing external clients to directly hit backend services, which is both a security and scalability problem. So one way that teams look at simplifying this model is to create potentially mashup services that are going to you know, decrease the, that churn and give a more simplified API service to, to our clients. So they're not themselves calling all these disparate services, but you know we have a middle layer that is going to handle that for us. So in this example here, we have our clients that are contacting these mashups. The mashups could be Lambdas, they could be Cloudflare workers, they could be cloud functions, they could be your own proxy, whatever that may be. However, we're gonna run into different and potentially more complex issues because of having this mashup here. So again, what's wrong with this? We've increased complexity. We now have this middle layer um, of potentially many, many mashup services, which you know could be calling themselves. They could be, you know, it's really hard to kind of keep track of what all these mashups are doing and like where they're calling. And, you know, and then again, then there's this maintenance of these mashups. So who owns these mashups? You know, what teams are relying on them? You have again a, a discovery and maintenance issue. Um, like I said, you could have duplication of data across these mashups. So we're kind of back to square one where we're making all these redundant calls because these mashups become you know, overly broad and now other teams are pulling from them and you create this type coupling. Um, and, and there's no holistic view of your API because you have, again, unless it's well-documented, you have kind of all these mashups that are living who knows where or multiple places. Um, and you know, developers who are, implementing these clients, you know, might not have a good idea on where to get the information they need. So they end up making their own and, you know, we, we get into this vicious cycle. So to solve the issues we've been describing, we decided to explore how GraphQL can play a role in solving those. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a graph query language. It was developed by Facebook in 2012, and they had the first public release in 2015. GraphQL using the query language to request data you want from the server. So query sent to GraphQL server are usually post request sent to slash GraphQL endpoint. In our example, we are asking the server to retrieve information about team 147 and only requesting its name. One of the most powerful features of GraphQL is the ability to selectively return partial data from a statically defined model. On response, we got team uh, 147's name, which is New York Yankees. A typical GraphQL service is made up of three interconnected parts. The first being the well-defined statically typed models that are similar to other serialization formats like Protobuf. These models describe what the output of our graph will look like to implementing clients. In this example, we have a type team that has an ID of int and name of string. These models can include any number of other fields. There are a variety of primitive GraphQL types, but users can easily implement their own object models. A special type of query defines how implementing clients can query the graph. In our example, we have one query of get teams that accepts an array of ints and returns an array of teams. The second pillar of GraphQL service is the resolver. The resolver is taken inputs from a query, call upstream services to resolve the desired data and return the data in the defined output model. It is here that we've separated the front end and back end data model to provide the flexible interlock between the two. The third pillar is obviously the upstream services, of which there could be one or more that are required to resolve the output model. So going back to our high-level architecture diagram, we now have our GraphQL server as the proxy middle layer between our clients and our upstream services. Our GraphQL server consumes our models and provides them to our clients in how to query the graph. The resolvers take the request, call the services, and return the message result. 
some pros in this architecture, uh, we have all of our codes in one place. We have a single server that teams can work against and easily view our RPA service. Deployments are easier because we're just dealing with a single server. However, as we start scaling our teams in contributing to the graph, it starts to become logistically complex. Iterating on our monolith starts to create tight coupling between our models. We also have to deal with a single point of failure, which is an ideal. So enter um, Apollo, which is a third party company um, that extends the GraphQL spec created by Facebook. And um, specifically it's around federation. And so federation is a topology of services where you have multiple independent services united by a gateway or router that is able to take each piece of, the, of a subgraph. So each of these services essentially is a single responsibility within your graph, stitches them all together and provides that that super graph to the implementing clients. So going back to our, our kind of diagram here, we have our clients who hit our gateway or the router and that those routers or those, that router interfaces with these sub services, which have their own models and their own resolvers. Um, and what comes with this is not only the ability to separate out pieces of your graph in a more kind of modular way, but it also gives you the ability to now do inter-service communication between your two services. So now you now have these uh, sub-graph services that are responsible for their own thing. They query their own data sources. But if one subgraph needs information from another subgraph, you now have the ability to to essentially query each other's subgraphs to create more complex queries. So the pros behind this are each service is responsible for its larger part of the graph or creating more separation because as your graph starts to grow and get complex, it can be very hard to reason about within one single server. Um, it's easier for larger teams to contribute because they're owning pieces of these graphs. So usually subgraphs map one-to-one -one usually, or, or potentially multiple teams could um, service multiple pieces of the graph, um, but you're now giving responsibility away from potentially a single GraphQL team within your organization. And now each, each kind of uh, uh, underlying team is now maintaining their own piece of the subgraph. Um, these can also be independently uh, versioned and deployed irrespective of other pieces. As long as you're not breaking the graph, we're going to go into mitigations against that. Teams can iterate as fast as they want to and ship as frequently as they want to to, to get things out, um, irrespective of what the other uh, services are doing. Some cons against this are it's much more complex CI/CD. So in terms of checking that the graph that you're, the subgraph that you're pushing is not going to break other pieces, there are uh, utilities uh, available by Apollo in order to you know manage that but it is a concern um so it, you could potentially break the graph right also the connections between our subgraphs are not super clear so we're going to get into the semantics behind how this uh inner service communication works but it, and there are ways to view the complete super graph, but it is somewhat opaque in terms of which subservice owns which pieces of the graph when you're looking at the full graph itself. So you kind of have to dive into things or have people who are knowledgeable on how the entire graph works in order to kind of grep everything that's going on. So this is the representation of our federated graph. We still have more teams to unboat and bring in their backend data into our federated graph, but you already can see how many services are available for consumers to use with only one single entry point to the gateway. So now we're gonna get into a little bit more uh, of the nuts and bolts of how a lot of these um, ideas work within federation. One of the most important aspects of federated GraphQL is the ability for subgraph services to communicate with each other in a seamless developer experiences, where the developer doesn't need to know where other models live. They just need to extend already established models and add their desired properties into them. Over the past six months, MLB has started to implement more personalized content within our web platform. In doing so, we want to attach personalized information to our user for consumption. Here we have a user type that has an ID of string and a favorite team of team. However, the team model doesn't live in the user service, but in the baseball service. So when the client requests the user's favorite team, 
What is actually happening is our query enters the gateway and resolves the user. The gateway sees that the favorite team has been requested of type team. So after we get the favorite team ID from our user service, the gateway automatically sends that favorite team ID to the baseball service to resolve the entire team for consumption. In the center of the slide are some semantics around how to supply the connections between the services in Apollo's Federation, returning a type that exists in another service and that type defining a resolve reference allows this cross communication to happen. Um, and so again, when we're talking about redundancy and the safety of our graph, right? Um, and, and making it as efficient as possible, we want to talk about how different caching strategies work within a federated architecture. And so looking at this query we have here, it's, it's somewhat more complex and under the hood, a lot of things are going on, but on the whole, we want to get slash Yankee. So MLB.com slash Yankee. So we want to get the title of the page. We want to get the components that make up that page. And specifically in this query, we're looking for videos. And on those videos, we want to find the team name of the teams involved in that video. And so what happens is we go into the gateway, we send this query in, and we're gonna make calls out to each of our services that can supply that information, which includes our CMS, the DAPI, which is like uh, the actual content itself, um, and the baseball service or stats API. So a baseball stats data. So we're gonna make those calls out to our external services. Um, and each of those external services are gonna respond with a cache control header. So when we make a call to the CMS, we get 10, 30 for the DAPI, and 3,600 3, from Stats API because that stuff isn't changing um, all that often, right? So how do we end up caching this stuff? Well, we're, we're able to cache the entire query results at the gateway at the lowest max age from all of the uh, services that were called to make up the, the query response for this query. And so what it does is it coalesces all those down, finds the least one, stores that in, in our example here, Redis for 10 seconds, um, and you know, the process continues. And so we're caching it as close as possible um, to you know, the request coming in um, at the minimum uh, max age that was supplied. But as we know, some services and their responses are not cacheable, whether it's dynamic data or, or sensitive data, and so what about partial query caching? We still want our queries to respond quickly, but there are you know, obviously times where it's uncacheable. So let's talk about our favorite team example here. So we want to get a favorite team for a given user ID. That query goes into the gateway. We're going to go to each of our services to pull that data, which is the user in the baseball service. We're going to go out and call our profile service in the stats API. The stats API, as our previous example, returns a max age of 3,600. However, user data is not going to be cacheable because you know it's dynamic or it changes a lot or whatever. So what are we supposed to do in this instance? Well, we can't cache it at the gateway because the whole query cannot be cached since one piece of it cannot be cached. However, we can cache that sub query piece that involves the stats API at the baseball service level. So that's returned quicker. Um, you know, and then we'll wait for the user service to eventually resolve. But it's a way of still maintaining some speed in your graph resolution while making sure that you're not caching things that aren't going to be cached. So when we're starting to talk about now redundancy, you know, what happens if something's happening to our upstream services? We still want to, you know, have integrity in our graph. We still want to return data back to our, our clients. Well, let's talk about maybe some circuit breaking here. So again, same example, we want to get the favorite team for a given user, query goes in, we make a successful response to our profile service, but something's happening with stats API. It's taking too long to respond. It's throwing an error, things like that, depending on the business rules around, you know, what happens in these failure modes. For our stats API, we're gonna say, we're gonna cache every successful response that we make to the stats API for some long period of time, right? We're saying that if we need to serve this data stale, we can. So if there's an issue, we have that data already cached, in a, in a long in a long term cache, right? So we're going to be able to pull that out of cache and still uh, successfully return a result of this query um, while we wait for Stats API, API to become healthy again. So the last optimization we are going to cover is automatic persistent queries or APQs. APQs solve problems around payload size since some queries can be large over the wire as well as caching at the edge. 
because GraphQL by default operates using POST, we are unable to cache our response at the edge. What APQs afford us is the ability to cache, uh, to hash and cache the query body itself while using GET requests to, uh, to cache at the edge for bigger savings. Here's our typical architecture diagram. We have our CDN and our graph is making external calls to our services. Everything works the same. However, a series of events happen to start caching at the CDN. First, we send a GET request with a hash query value. If we haven't seen this before or the cache has expired, we send our traditional POST request with the full query and the hash value to be cached. On subsequent calls, successful GET requests are then cached at the CDN using the previous cache semantics for query caching. One of the uh, things that you can really start to extract out and, and use to enhance not only the graph itself, but your organization is leveraging a lot of metrics around how your queries are doing, um, the health of them, the speed, the latency, um, and, and a bunch of different metrics. Some of these are from Apollo specifically. So Apollo has a cloud product where these first two uh, images are, are, are part of that, where we can see what are the requests per minute for all the different types of queries that we have, what's the latency, what are the errors, and they have built-in tracing. So we can start to dive into as queries are executed and they're being federated out, where are where is the slowest happening? What services are, are our slowest services? How do we make improvements to those services? Are there specific um, uh, parameters within the queries that are throwing errors, things like that? And then to uh, uh, complement that, we have a whole Prometheus Grafana, um, you know, more infra monitoring. However, we can see at a granular level for each service, um, how, you know, what the health of those are um, uh, in more detail. So lessons learned so far. We have definitely some wins. Uh, we went into production in May. We have a subset of total services and uh, we're doing 60 requests per second at peak time. Um, we decreased number of calls between the services. No more stitching within clients. Payloads decreased. Teams leverage and federation no longer need to worry about data access. We also increase visibility upstream with tracing and centralized data access, reduce ambiguity and ease discovery. So of course, with everything, there's gonna be caveats and there's gonna be challenges when implementing an architecture that has this kind of scope within your organization. The first is the upfront cost um, you know, within your organization to learn the GraphQL syntax, the grammar, the, 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 the particularities around federation. Um, a lot of that's you know, a, a social, socialization within your organization about how these things work. There's a lot of different models by which you know, um, Apollo themselves, but just the community recommends you, know, you set up teams to do this, but you know, it's a challenge. Um, Again, the federation, the service, you know, not so much service discovery, but figuring out which parts of the subgraph are owned by which services can be challenging um, without, you know, either documentation or, again, people knowledgeable with the entire graph. Um, with any, you know, uh, not only product, but just architecture, there has to be organizational buy-in. So challenges around that are, you know, uh, the ease of use of onboarding new teams, you know, scaffolding out projects so that they can get running really quickly things of that nature. Um, and governance requires a lot of oversight. So when I talk about governance, that could be of the architecture itself. That could be, again, of the ta taxonomy of, of your graph, right? That could be, um, you know, who owns which services. Um, there's a lot that goes into really managing this layer and how it works in your broader organization that takes time. And, and every organization is different and they're going to come up with different patterns or different teams or however to, to execute this. Um, but it, it really is an iterative process. Speaking for us specifically, we've gone through a couple of these as we've started scaling out this within our organization. Um, and we're still, you know, we're still working out what is going to work best for, best for us and what's going to scale ultimately. So there are some resources if you would like to go ahead and look closer at to GraphQL. 
Uh, there is a GraphQL doc to give you more details about anatomy. There is also Apollo docs if you're interested in uh, Apollo version of GraphQL or Apollo Federation. Also, please check out Apollo GraphQL Summit where Matt will be a part of the round table. And as always, connect with us. Check out our profile for LinkedIn links and other ways to connect with us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for uh, enjoy or, uh, joining us at our talk. We'll see you at the Q&A. See you in Q&A. Bye. Well, Alessia and Matt, thanks for your presentation. I think this probably struck a chord with a lot of people at this conference because you know most of us have wholeheartedly embraced microservice architectures. And with that comes, you know, service sprawl and data governance and um, performance issues, all these all these kind of things that you touched on. So, and it's really interesting to see somebody solving those problems in a certain way. Um, so uh, we have done a really good job answering questions in the chat. I'll try and keep my eye on those. I'm trying to keep few, up. You did pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I have a few, few questions of my own, but I think the most pressing question we should address since uh, for those watching a recording of this, we're in the middle of the World Series right now. So who wins game six of the World Series tomorrow, Atlanta or Houston? I'm going Braves. <laughs> Alessia, do you have an opinion? Uh, no. No. <laughs> okay. I can imagine it's a busy no time. No comment. At, I can imagine it's a busy time at MLB. Um, can I guess my, the first question I have is you, you highlighted the importance of graph governance in in making this happen. Is is that just kind of a social problem, organizational problem, or is that also a technical problem? And are there tools or techniques or, or suggestions you have around graph graph governance? Yeah, um, I feel like this really echoes um, the first talk where I'll, you know. A challenge, a lot of stuff that we talk about is very technical, but half the battle also is the organization, the people, getting people excited about it, onboarding, and, and the logistics around operating these large systems. And I think in any organization, when you have a, a, an architecture that's going to span a decent part of your or part of your organization, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that comes with that, a lot of coordination. And it's it is a very human problem. And I, I think as we've started going through this process it's it's been very iterative where we we started with a small team we started opening up to the larger organization we started getting feedback we started then playing around with different governance structures whether that's a small governance team whether that's a an in-house like uh like graph platform team what or or what have you we're still trying to i think figure out what's going to work the best for us but there is just a lot of uh, I think uh, uh, coordination and and socialization of what the graph is supposed to do, the expectations of it, and then within your tech organization, how you're going to farm out and and uh, uh, validate that the changes, whether it's technical changes, whether it's your taxonomy of your graph, like there's a lot that goes into kind of having everybody on the same page. And I think it's different from normal kind of, you know, uh, standard, everyone has their own REST service or, or they have gRPC or whatever, where the teams are kind of siloed. And then if you need something, you go to that team. This is much more broad where there has to be a constant kind of communication between all the teams, because at the end of the day, it's one graph, even though within Federation, like how, kind of what I alluded to, each team kind of manages their sub graph or sub service, right? It uh, eventually is coalesced into one super graph. And so, you know, it's, it is, you're juggling a lot of things. And I think we're, moving toward having a centralized team that is kind of the traffic cop of all this stuff mm -hmm. and just making sure that you know there's a high set of principles or policies that are being followed um but i think at the end of the day you need to relinquish control in order to keep the gears turning because if there's too much process you're just going to really slow things down you can Got see it. we're really passionate about governance <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's been uh, yeah it process. It seems it seems like a problem someone could overlook in trying to do this and and then not have it be successful. 
Yeah, I think, uh, so how GraphQL kind of started MLB is we had our, our they're called Fetty or like the editorial team who, who, who does a lot of the front end work. They kind of ran with their own just single regular GraphQL um, server. And just to kind of make the, the, the uh, division between these two things really clear. So GraphQL, Facebook spec, and then Apollo third party extended the spec to include federation and a couple other things. So they are they are separate, however, going toward a, a similar goal. Um, but the, the first group kind of experimented with just GraphQL. And then we kind of started taking that paradigm, saw what Apollo was doing and we're like, okay, well, we can extend this out throughout the entire organization. Um, but it, it really was a bottom up effort. Um, and I think it's different where if you, within your organization, you know, you have a CTO or a director of engineering who's saying, we are going to become a graph first company. And then it kind of comes from top down. And there's an edict. It is different when it's more of a grassroots, um, you know, uh, <laughs> like powered thing. Um, and it, it takes a lot more convincing, a lot more, I think, make realizing the value prop of, of what it could be um, because it's going to be a multi-year process. I mean, two to five years, probably depending on how big, your, your infra is, you know, across the entire tech or to convert it over to where you, you see a lot of the benefits of adopting something like this. Nice. Um, maybe to pick up one of the questions in the chat, someone's asking about alternatives to Apollo. And it, um, so, yeah, I'd be interested to hear if someone who doesn't want to use Apollo or their other alternatives and maybe also address um, in an environment where it's not just JSON and HTTP, or over HTTP, where maybe some services have moved to gRPC, or what are the alternatives there? And maybe in a completely gRPC world where someone wants to do federation, is, do you have any advice there? Yeah, so I guess in terms of, of alternatives, like there are a bunch, a bunch of reference implementations of GraphQL amongst the languages themselves. And so Apollo is kind of leading the JavaScript reference implementation um, and, you have things like Sangria, which are in Scala uh, and, and, a, and a, a, across all the languages. They're kind of, you know, not run by a company, right? They're just grassroots kind of libraries. Um, so no, Apollo is definitely not the only, they're driving the Federation spec piece. And so I guess you would have lock in there, but in terms of using GraphQL genuinely, like you, you're kind of free to do, do what you will. Um, in terms of leveraging other, um, transport paradigms so within your resolvers like you like in a lot of our work obviously our services our upstream services our internal services are all just restful services really we don't have a ton of grpc within our organization um, but within the resolvers however you're getting your information it's very open-ended in terms of how how you want to resolve your queries where you're getting that data from whether it's directly from a database whether it's through grpc whether it's through a rest service like the GraphQL is pretty agnostic in terms of how you resolve the data to resolve your query. So in that sense, you could pull from any data source by whatever means are available to you in order to leverage GraphQL. I mean, think about it as just a glorified proxy, right? GraphQL is however, you get a bunch of the query semantics, everything on top of it to make working with your data a lot easier. And then if you lever leverage federation, you get a lot of the fun interconnected bits so that Subservices within your organization don't need to go out what redundantly to other pieces to get the data. You can use the graph in order to leverage your infrastructure as a whole. Okay, we have about five minutes left. Maybe touch on the, it seems there's probably a lot of wins from doing, uh, you know, caching, circuit breaking, these kind of things centrally. Someone has a question actually, do, do you do rate limiting through through this central service? Um, and then maybe some of the drawbacks of that too, like someone's saying about Conway's law and having one, you know, monolithic API, like, but it seems like there's a lot of wins from having this centrally and, but also attention and maybe even contrast to some how what it would look like trying to use maybe a service mess approach or something like that that's yeah that isn't as coordinated and and uh, opinionated maybe i think i think so in terms of rate limiting we don't have any rate limits yet because so we're we're, we're not anywhere near 100 percent in terms of converting our entire infra over we're doing this very piecemeal um so we have just a fraction of our traffic 
or I guess you can think about it as features that are being served out of the graph currently, but slowly migrating things over. So eventually we'll approach rate limiting. Um, and I think that that won't, I don't, I think that'll be divorced from the, the graph architecture as well. Like we'll either use it at the CDN or whatever and, and, and do that. Um, but uh, in terms of kind of drawbacks, like I, I think the first question that we were talking about, there is a lot that goes into organizing your organization around the common goal. Because like I, I said, fully realize the power of the graph. You want to have you know a ton of your teams, if not all of them, maintain subservices, feeding up into your super graph and being able to be deployed out. That is a very uh, noble goal, right? And I think that a lot of us, you know, who have been architects or or seniors who are, are architecting out their systems, like it's kind of pie in the sky to think that you're gonna get everybody on board to do the same thing. And even when you do at that scale, logistically, it's a burden in order to maintain everything, all the moving parts. And so like, I think, yes, like to your question, I think it would be simpler to go service mesh-esque route However, like you're not going to get a lot of the things that you're going to get with Apollo and strictly Federation for free, like the inner service communication bits. Like, I mean, you get uh, tracing out of the box for free too. And so as your query resolves and it goes through all these different sub graphs, you can see, and I went through that slide super quick, but you can see the time it takes, what data resolved and everything and really dive in to see what upstreams are taking forever and work with those teams and try to optimize that. Um, but you know, I think it's, it, it's really pros cons and it really, I think it really depends on what your organization is already and like where you kind of see it going forward and what your specific problems are. Okay. We have about one minute left, maybe one more question. There's lots of questions. So I hope everyone joins the hallway track after and we can continue the discussion. So maybe last question is, do you have to interact much with the federated query planner or is that just basically resolving? based on the model and you don't have to do much yeah no you we we haven't touched it at all um it's pretty good and, and granted we haven't gotten super complex in our queries but it's it's pretty smart to know you know obviously what to resolve when and how apollo is going to start opening up more utilities in order to give hints to the query planner on like you i want you to resolve this first or or this or that um but no for the most part we haven't had to touch it at all it's also a great tool for you to actually see how it's been resolved and the way you can optimize where your code is lacking, actually, because, you know, the query is based on the code on your resolvers. So it's a good picture of where your code is and can you optimize it, actually, starting with your code yeah. and then let GraphQL do the rest. The optimization. Uh, yeah. That includes like call paths as well as timing and... Yes, you could, uh, yeah, Apollo, yeah. Apollo, not... Apollo Studio shows you actually, mm -hmm. yeah, how long it's. Yeah, been. we're using Studio. Somebody asked that we in use, chat. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yep. Great. Okay, I think we should go join the, the hallway chat and continue the discussion. Thanks again for this. I think it's an important talk. We're all dealing with service sprawl, and right. this is a really interesting expro uh, approach. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.